Welcome back to session two of the pandemic puzzle, building toward health equity and an inclusive recovery. Our last panel focused on the chronic disease crisis here in the United States. And our upcoming panel, our next panel is going to consider the global challenge of responding to COVID-19 in areas around vaccines, PPE, ventilators, and of course, funding. And I'm now going to hand it over to Drew Armstrong, Bloomberg News Senior Healthcare Editor, who will moderate the panel on strengthening global pandemic coordination and access to resources. Take it away, Drew. Great, thanks so much. Um, and uh, I'm Drew Armstrong, I'm Bloomberg Senior Editor for Healthcare. You can see behind me here, I'm in New York City where I've been covering the coronavirus pandemic for the last uh, year and a half plus. Um, I'm excited today to talk about the global response, the issues of resource inequality and competition. And I'm joined today by Professor Michelle Gelfand. She's the Professor of Cross-Cultural Management and Organizational Behavior at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. I should also mention that she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Steve Davis, uh, the Interim Director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, who's also the Senior China Strategy Advisor there. And Lois Pace um, from the US government, the Director of the Office of Global Affairs at the US Department of Health and Human Services. So I wanna jump right in by asking a question about vaccines. Um, I should note we have about uh, 45 minutes to almost an hour for our panels today. So we should have a nice detailed and robust discussion. But we're more than 10 months now into the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. And we see issues of inequality that continue to persist across the world. You know, we have wealthy countries, that have vaccination rates of 75% or better. Um, but there are also some wealthy countries like the United States that lag at around 60%. I, I wanna ask our panelists, before we delve into some issues of wealth inequality and vaccination, how we got these significant disparities that we're now seeing from countries that are quite similar um, from a healthcare and economic standpoint and what the consequences are for the United States in particular of being a nation with more access to vaccines than almost anywhere else. But what I think has been, you know, we're now seeing significantly less demand from that. Um, I'm gonna open up to all our panelists who wanna to, to get, to jump in on that. Maybe Michelle, if you, wanna, if you wanna start here, I mean, do we have, why did we end up with some of these countries that are so similar from a, in many ways, cultural and economic standpoint, but really beginning to see some stark differences emerge. Is that you know behavioral, governmental, organizational? Yeah, all of the above. I, you know, it's a great question, and I think what we've learned is that we can have all the wealth, the technology, the incredible access to vaccines, but we also have to deal with the human element, the many psychological barriers that exist to get vaccinated. Um, we know there's a lot of misinformation about both the seriousness of COVID-19 and the effectiveness of vaccines out there. You know, some people still don't believe it. It's a serious threat. And unlike threats like warfare or terrorism, um, COVID's not very concrete um, or vivid. It's intangible uh, and it's abstract. So it's easier to ignore. Uh, and there's also a lot of conspiracy theories about COVID and vaccines. And in fact, research shows that when there's a lot of uncertainty, people really latch on to conspiracy theories to have a, feel, a feeling of self-control. Uh, and it's also important to remember that we're social creatures. We look to others in our networks when we make decisions. We look to the social norms around us to tell us whether or not others are getting vaccines or not. And it's a big problem because actually people who don't get vaccinated are way more vocal than uh, people who do. And so we may misestimate the norm. Uh, and in fact, in our research, um, we find that a lot of people report they're willing to get the vaccine, but they think Americans in general are less willing to get it. Um, psychologists call this pluralistic ignorance. We're all saying we're okay with it, but we think others won't do it. And so we act on that misperception. Um, so we really need to develop ways to get the word out about how many people are actually getting vaccinated. We need the pro-vaccination people to speak out, especially big influencers. And I would just say, you know, more generally to sort of counteract these false beliefs, we need more than just top-down campaigns. We need to enlist local leaders and churches uh, civic groups, local organizations to get the message out that COVID's serious, that vaccines are safe. Uh, barbershops around the country have been a great source of persuasion, for example, because people tend to trust their barbers. So we need to really uh, take into account the human element uh, in looking at these disparities. Stephen Lewis, I'd, I'd be curious to know you all's perspective. I mean, some of the you know, United States, obviously, the issues here are not 
unique, but have we seen some of the issues around hesitancy either replicate or echoed in other places of the world? I, I know we have vaccine access issues, but you know, I spend a lot of time, have spent a lot of time over the last year looking at public health websites around the globe and everything like that. And you see some of the kind of same issues of hesitancy popping up and, and health organizations attempting to combat those whether it be a you know a less wealthy nation in a developing part of the world or you know a place like the United States, how much of that is just commonality versus you know these issues being kind of spread from the United States, which obviously gets a lot of attention just being the country that it is, um, and, and other countries looking and saying, wait a second, people are hesitant there. There might be some issue here with uh, you know we we are also worried about the same thing. Yeah, um, uh, vaccine hesitancy is, in a, is a very curious thing because we've been tracking it for quite a few years. This isn't unique and new, but what's been interesting is particularly lower and lower middle income countries, it hasn't been much of a problem. I mean, we've had incidences around vaccines that have gone bad and like in the Philippines with, you know, in the past, but, but that it hasn't, we've seen more the opposite that in a lot of countries, people are lining up to get their kids vaccinated and not as worried. COVID's changed a lot of that. Um, so we see across the globe different rates of vaccine hesitancy um, change and accelerate. Um, and and uh, it's it's been quite unique on some level because, um, uh, you know, I mean, the WHO is calling this an infodemic as well as a pandemic. And it has to do with, I think, three things. One is there the, the level of misinformation because of social media and because of new tools we have is, is, is phenomenal. Um, two, COVID, because because of the kind of origins and all of that has created some mis mystery around it. And that's created uh, our additional problems. But three, and I'd say foremost of, of all of them, it's political leadership. So, um, you know, we've seen where Brazil and, and different parts of, uh, you know, Latin America, we've seen in, in sort of more nationalist uh, uh, conservative groups in other parts of the world uh, also, uh, uh, you know, kind of criticize the the protection, criticize vaccines, and that that really matters. And the correlation between political belief and vaccine hesitancy is very high. And so this is not just a unite u, unique U.S. issue. No, I agree with that. I mean, everything that's been said by Steve and Michelle about mis and disinformation is absolutely relevant here, and it's important to make that distinction, right? Because there's um, sort of the, the issue we have around information that might be unavailable or confusing or sort of unintentionally misleading. And then there's the direct campaigns that are in place that we've seen not only in the public health space, but in other spaces across our society that are steering people deliberately in the wrong direction. And so that's something that absolutely needs to be tackled. And that needs to be tackled both at a governmental level, uh, including with multilateral bodies like the WHO, as Steve mentioned, but also with industry and other institutions and stakeholders that can help us break through to these audiences. But a, another important layer of this is how we need to view a lot of this across the spectrum. And I'm sure Michelle can speak to this even better. There are people who are just going to be recalcitrant about whether or not they um, are going to sort of believe any sort of truths around COVID-19 or the innovations related to COVID like a vaccine. But then there are plenty of people who are not quite there on the spectrum, but rather just have questions, right? Or have concerns or, you know, are uh, perhaps not hesitant, but curious. And I think, you know, Dr. Kizzy, who helped develop the vaccine talks about vaccine inquisitiveness. I think it's important um, to take those people into account too and, and consider the targeted messages we need for those different audiences. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And in fact, one of the exciting things happening um, is, is the sort of joint interdisciplinary collaboration among social scientists trying to get out there to figure out what messages work. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes no, none of them work because of the partisanship um, that Steve was mentioning. Uh, we did a big tournament where we were trying to nudge people to wear masks among representative samples in the U.S. Um, we tried to um, nudge people by talking about the seriousness of, of this threat, um, helping the community, um, that this would help the economy eventually. And none of the nudges really helped overcome the partisanship. But we are seeing, um, when it comes to vaccines, some um, nudges that are working. Um, out of um, Penn, there was a big intervention tournament by Katie Milkman and her colleagues that found that when people were told that and reminded that 
um, there was a uh, vaccine waiting for them that was reserved for them um, at their pharmacy, they were much more likely to go and get it. And part of their explanation was that it kind of activates this loss aversion. Oh, something's waiting for me. I better not give that up. Um, so it's really interesting to see, you know, the things that we think would nudge people don't, but then we were finding some evidence slowly and surely of things that are working. Drew, can I come back to this other part of your question as well about yeah, people living outside the U.S.? Because this is really important uh, and, I, and it's been flagged by colleagues um, who don't work in the U.S., but are hearing um, messages that say, well, you know, there's so much hesitancy in low and middle income countries. And as Steve said, we, we have been you know, sort of dealing with that as a challenge as part of other immunization programs. But let's be clear, plenty of people in other countries around the world want this vaccine. And they have many of their citizens been looking to the US as a really odd example of a place where there is access to this life-saving technology and yet not as great a demand as in places that, that don't have um, vaccines at their disposal. So I, I think we should also work hard as health professionals to dispel the myth that is, seems to be building that hesitancy and confidence is sort of an outsized pro problem in these places um, because they absolutely need to be receiving these life-saving technologies from vaccines to testing to treatments, and there's absolutely a, a willingness and a readiness to receive those um, pretty broadly across, um, across countries around the world. That's actually a great transition to where I wanna go next, which is the COVAX program. Um, and I'm gonna start this off with Steve, and then um, uh, Lois, I'd like to come back to you. And Steve, from where you sit, I wanna get your letter grade assessment of COVAX so far, and I'll 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 set this up um, from where from where I sit. You know, we follow this really closely. It's about fifty low income nations that have vaccinated less than ten percent of their population. You have a lot of countries in Africa where those vaccination rates are less than one percent or two percent. Um, you know, Covax has cut its supply forecast for the end of the year by twenty five percent. I mean, you know, where do you grade this? So far, we've got a virus that seems to be moving a lot faster than the um, international, multinational um, vaccination efforts. Yeah, well, um, so, you know, the, the quick answer would be we're probably hovering in the, you know, in the B category. Um, and I would say that because I think, um, and I very close to COVAX and the people that I think are so well-intentioned who've been trying to pull this together. Um, but, you know, I think everybody admits we've, we've fallen short of what we had hoped. But let me frame, frame it a, a li little bit more broadly, because it's really easy to go, oh, well, it didn't get its goal, so it's a failure. First of all, this is a very, very dynamic situation where, you know, six months from now, we'll be talking about a completely different set of issues. In fact, we already are, as we see the globe will be flooded more with vaccines cap at, around the world and not flooded, maybe over exaggerating, but we'll have a lot more supply. The question then becomes delivery and capacity to deliver. And I mean, last night I was on the phone trying to figure out how do we get more syringes into Africa. I mean, you know, those are the things we're, we're, we're struggling with. Um, so A, dynamic. B, you know, COVAX was, you know, uh, trying to create a big global mechanism in the middle of a crisis is super hard. Um, and, you know, so COVAX has been playing catch up from the very beginning. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's actually quite different than I think where we look ahead, and I'll, we'll probably get to that later, but, you know, how do we get ahead of these things? How do we have that sort of allocation methodology and governance and financing and all of those other things sorted out before we're scrambling in the middle of a crisis? And I think that's a second issue. Clearly, the allocation question is, is at the core of the question. Like, okay, how did we end up with this huge disparity, which is both morally outrageous and frankly, from a public health perspective, perspective not adequate because it's mm -hmm. not going to end the pandemic. But, you know, I think there's some real politics here too, which is, you know, it is very, very difficult for a politician of any country to say, I'm not going to, my first and foremost obligation is to my own citizens. And, and, and understanding that complicated dynamic and then building that into how do you then create an allocation methodology that isn't just one size fits all, but also is dynamic enough to track the sort of quick changing, you know, pace of this pandemic is, is, is going to be super important. So I think there's a, 
there's also a piece there. So sure, we didn't, we didn't, uh, we, I don't think many people would say Kovacs knocked, I mean, Kovacs has knocked the ball out of the park to use that American expression. But what I don't know if we have many better mechanisms on the multilateral side out there. So we need to sort of optimize it moving forward. I'd also just want to comment because I've also been quite involved, as you might guess, in sort of supporting and managing and figuring out how does the Chinese vaccines play in and how does China, because I've been overseeing the China program for the Gates Foundation this year, which has been quite complex. But, um, but um, you know, there are a lot of other bilateral vaccines being delivered. And the other thing I think we need to do in COVAX, you know, is only one, is only a piece of the overall puzzle of how do you actually look at the entire dashboard of vaccine availability, efficacy, uh, you know, what is that? And also the delivery capabilities and tools from an end-to-end -end perspective across both multilateral and bilateral um, uh, programs, because that's really going to be the ultimate answer here. So this, uh, this brings up about 10 different things that I want to spend a little bit of time on. I, I want to go first to, to Lois and put her on the spot because, you know, mm -hmm. I remember having a conversation with the Biden administration maybe six months or so and asking, you know, some of these questions about when was the U.S. going to really start sending more vaccine abroad? And, you know, the answer I got, and, you know, the, not, not unsurprisingly, you know, I think this fits very much into what you're saying about some of the complicated political dynamics of what we're here, uh, that we hear about was that, you know, hey, we want to make sure we have a situation of abundance in the U.S. where nobody who needs a vaccine in the United States can't find one when they go to the pharmacy before we really start thinking about, you know, significant exports in the United States. Now we're at a place where the Biden administration is saying, you know, they've pledged a billion doses globally, but that that's going to take until, you know, I believe September of 2022 to fully execute on that commitment. You know, Lois, let me let me ask both you and Steve this question: mm -hmm. Is that fast enough? I mean, we're talking about a you know a pandemic where a virus is going to either burn through you know immunological dry kindling or bump up against vaccines. You know, there's two options here. Mm -hmm. We've seen how quickly this thing is capable of spreading, especially with the Delta variant. Is this going to be a mood issue by the time we get to 12 months from now um, for a lot of the rest of the world that is going to be depending on those shots? Okay, a few things. Uh, first, uh, I think the U.S. is around 400 million that we have uh, distributed in terms of vaccines in our own country within our borders. Um, we're closing in on about 200 million um, that we've shared with the world. So I think that's an important, those are some important metrics um, for me at least, um, to really take a look at sort of how we're pacing against, you know, sort of what, what we're doing at home and what we're doing abroad. Um, we know that more needs to be done, which is why the president's made the commitments that he has to share this additional um, billion that you mentioned. First, the 500 million that's already you know, going out the door um, through early next year, and then an additional 500 million. But the, the U.S. is not supposed to be doing that by ourselves. And it's absolutely why we need the rest of the world also who's able to share their surplus to do so. And this comes back to this idea of Steve didn't use this term, he talked about a dashboard, but I think at baseline, we need more transparency around what is available and who is committed to show what and how that's tracking. Because that's what we don't know and that's what we don't have in place. And that's what COVAX you know, needs in, in addition to the US and other countries who have raised their hands to say, yeah, we want to be helpful. Because countries ultimately don't know what's in the pipeline, where they are in the queue, when it's coming, what they're receiving. And that's that's a big issue, right? Um, because we need to be tracking better than we have been. So the US is doing our part and trying to step up in ways that we know need to happen from a public health standpoint, let alone for all the other reasons people have, have mentioned. And we're encouraging others like through the summit the president held to, to do the same. And so, you know, ideally we can kind of level up, not just in our commitments, but in, in the way we're sharing um, and, and again, sort of bring more, shine more light into the process so that we all, and particularly countries and COVAX, um, have a fighting chance of beating this thing. On the COVAX front too, I, you know, I agree with Steve, it's, it's been a hard road. And I think it's been for, you know, the reasons of not having as much transparency as they need. It's also an issue around the supply chain, which we you know, might have predicted whether that's around syringes or, or, or vaccines themselves or something else entirely, um, like the raw materials for those. Um, 
but it's the U.S. has shared both through COVAX and also bilaterally. And I can tell you, being at an agency that has been responsible for <laughs> trying to understand the legalities and liabilities and the logistics, you know, just getting vaccines and products to country, let alone what then happens to get shots in arms, it is so much easier to have that centralized in a place or in a facility like COVAX bringing in the resources and the expertise of a World Health Organization and a Gavi Vaccine Alliance and UNICEF and others, not to mention ministries of health and country uh, and, and WHO regional offices to help sort of wade through all of those moving parts. And I mean, if not for nothing, not a lot of people understand all that vaccine sharing entails, um, but all of those pieces require just so much time and expertise around the table. And COVAX did a lot of work to try and figure that out on the front end. And so, you know, it's our hope um, that we can continue to support them, which we have, right? And, and that they can be even more successful than they have been to this point, because it's, you know, it's, a, it's, an, it's an easier way to go ultimately, um, if we can make that, that process work. Um. It looks like uh, Michelle might want to jump in here, but Steve, I did want to follow up with you. You mentioned something that I think it's important and, and I'll allow, you know, we can have any of the panelists jump in on this, but this idea that, you know, one of the things COVAX has showed is that the importance of having something like this set up well in advance. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, when we think about the power of international institutions, how countries relate to each other, and then the type of quite understandable, you know, uh, you know, more inward, you know, seeking behavior that we see is, you know, is setting up a program, COVAX or something like it in the midst of a crisis, as opposed to having structures like that with commitments in place well in advance of there ever being a need. Walk me through kind of how, what, how infrastructure needs to be in place pre-crisis versus developed, you know, in the middle of a crisis and how that's going to relate to how countries and people with and people and governments are going to act based on those things. And, and I realize, you know, that probably, you know, people are only as good, countries and people are only as good as their commitments, you know, and whether or not they hold to those things, how strong those commitments are. But you, I, I want to unpack that a, a little bit because I do think it's an important distinction that you, that you brought up. Yeah, well, you know, let, let me illustrate in very quickly in three ways. One is, um, you know, we, we saw in the middle of the Ebola crisis that when we were trying to introduce new innovations and new techniques, it's very, very hard because people are just, you know, they're always on their back foot scrambling to get the last crisis solved. And so I think we've learned the hard way in the field of social innovation, and there's lots of study, that it's very hard to introduce new innovation, even though there's a lot that happens in the middle of a crisis, that it's it's very hard to get that sustainable impact. So then you have to sort of optimize around, um, you know, the, the, the preparation stage of things. So, you know, we see, we've seen this before. Um, let me give you an example. CEPI, the, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. I was actually at that table. We had the very first meeting in Davos with, you know, heads of state and pharma leaders and a couple of us NGO leaders, et cetera, saying, you know, we got to get, we got to learn from Ebola and put something in place, get the financing, work out the complicated governance issues, get more people on board. And that resulted in, you know, something that frankly, Frankly, when, when the COVID hit, now it was pretty early on in CEPI's world, but when COVID hit, COVID, CEPI has done a very good job of accelerating their, you know, vaccine research and development. And, you know, we do need to comment that while, you know, it's frustrating to see that it's, it's, it's horrible to see this inequity, the pace at which we got a vaccine out is unbelievable and, you know, unprecedented. So, and some of that was due to the fact that a lot of investment had already been made in mRNA and other things over the years, but it was also due to the fact that we had set up mechanisms through like CEPI and things. So I think there are good examples of getting ahead of the game. Let me just put another spin on it. And we talk about vaccines all the time, but I've spent most of my last year, in addition to the China stuff, working on the digital health side. I chair the commission for the WHO's uh, digital health work. And, 
And, um, you know, there it's a classic example of enormous innovation. I mean, the stuff we've seen coming out of the innovative community from, you know, testing and tracking apps to telemedicine to population health modeling to AI, you know, to, for understanding the surveillance issues to all sorts of new things. And, and, and so it was quite exciting time um, in a crisis. But the fact is, is we lack the mechanism and the governance and the policy framework in which all of that innovation could find itself usefully being applied, particularly in lower and middle income countries and vulnerable communities. Communities. So therefore, you know, it's sort of back to this, we need to now rise to the occasion in sort of post-crisis mode, or we're still in the crisis, but, and, and develop some mechanisms like we did with vaccine distribution through Gavi, or we come up with more global governance models that I think are, are feasible and, and we've got to work collectively. But I think, you know, if we, you know, you've got to, we've got to try. I mean, I recognize that the inward nation, uh, the, some of the challenging geopolitics make this harder, but, but we can't just walk away from this and say, we'll just, you know, deal with every pandemic the same way. We've got mm -hmm. to get ahead of this. Yeah, I would just add, you know, to that echoing that, you know, this is a time when national self-interest in the middle of a pandemic um, is expected from a human psychology perspective um, toward protecting one's own group, what my colleague Nir Halevi calls in-group love. Um, and uh, this is actually even more pronounced during times of threat. We know that people start really honing in on their own in-group's interests um, to the neglect of out-groups start getting very ethnocentric. We've seen it during COVID across many, many nations that people who feel really fearful of COVID are uh, getting more ethnocentric. Uh, and this is of course really problematic during a, a global threat uh, where we're really all interdependent. And I think we need to start thinking uh, around this issue of cultivating global identity, that we're all in this together, uh, that what happens in countries thousands of miles away in terms of COVID is gonna invariably affect all of us um, and the more we're sort of united against a global threat, <laughs> sort of broadening our, our, our in-group, uh, the less ethnocentrism we'll have. So I think that there's the issue of coordination um, that we've all been talking about with COVAX and also the issue of mindset, of, of trying to sw really shift people's mindsets from their own self-interest toward a global um, focus. Michelle, yeah, I think... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, please jump in. Don't let me. I'd be really me. curious. This is not my my area, so I'm really glad we have Michelle here. Um, and I'd be very curious to learn about research that is looking more closely at those groups or populations or just individuals, right, who might have a greater affinity towards that sort of sense of global community, I guess, and solidarity. Um, I mean, we saw this anecdotally. In the wake of, well, I should say in the wake of the crisis that we're still living through, right? But in the early days in the U.S., we saw it um, as India was crashing, that people were showing up for each other. And so I, I'm taking this data that you're sharing and putting that alongside the very real display of human community and connectedness. And so I'm, I, I'm pulling on that thread you're, you're leaving out there and asking, well, what, what are the ways we can promote that human also very human response, right? Uh, and, and even if that's a, you know, in your research, a, a minority of what we've seen, we've seen it and, and it's possible. And that's what I suppose gives me hope in all of this is that, <laughs> that, that people can show up in that way and won't solely be yeah. self-interested. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, you should look to these nuggets of like optimism that we can do this. And I think a lot of it um, to um, Steve's point has to do with the leadership is sort of mm -hmm. the, one is leadership, but the other is that the more countries have had their own internal coordination problems, the more they've, of course, not been really able to show up on the global coordination. Mm. And for that matter, you know, I want to mention, you know, some of it, of course, has to do with um, geopolitical factors, uh, also wealth um, and so forth. But there's a lot of cultural um, dimensions of this crisis that I think don't get necessarily seen because culture is kind of invisible. And, and what we found in our studies a uh, paper was published in the Lancet uh, Planetary Health uh, in the fall of 2020 is that cultures that had really strict norms coming into the pandemic, and I don't mean authoritarian, I mean people who follow rules and uh, sort of can sacrifice their self-interest for the community. Um, countries like um, uh, Singapore um, and some European countries that did better like Austria, Germany, um, did much better than loose cultures that are much more permissive uh, and have looser rules 
Uh, and neither is good or bad. Loose cultures are really innovative. They're really much more tolerant. Tight cult cultures have a lot of order and a lot of coordination. But during a global threat, loose cultures have a lot of liability. And we saw mm -hmm. that by the middle of the fall, controlling for lots of factors that loose cultures had five times the cases and nearly nine times the deaths. Um, and what was remarkable is that loose cultures tend to be really optimistic. They had far less fear of COVID, even until mm -hmm. the fall when they were doing poorly. <laughs> Tight cultures still did much better and they were more fearful. They, they sustained that level of fear. And, and biologists call this an evolutionary mismatch, like traits that are really good in one context um, are really poorly aligned with the environment when it changes. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that suggests that we need to think about how are cultures that are, you know, kind of have certain cultural codes that work really well in some context, how do we kind of nudge them during times mm -hmm. of collective threat, particularly when they have a lot of optimism. So I think that internal coordination has also been a problem, clearly, for some cultures. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that we study in, in the field of cross-cultural psych. I, just two quick comments. I know we've got to move on, but one is I really lived that this year, um, <laughs> Michelle, um, living in a very loose culture in Seattle, Washington, but um, yeah. uh, uh, but um, running an office in Beijing where, you know, they were fully back to work and operational and, you know, I mean, the, it, the, 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 the contrast was was unbelievable, obviously, of a very, 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 you know, top down bureaucratic uh, health model, but nonetheless, it was pretty stag uh, stunning. I do think, you know, I would get be shamed to not mention at this point in the conversation though that this does get back also there's the 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 behavioral stuff which is so important there's the you know kind of leadership but there's also just this whole you know exposure of how weak some of these public health systems are mm -hmm. and and you know and that's not only in some of the communities in our country in this country but also in some countries of the world and that's the other disparity that we keep you know we can't forget like part of the reason this has played out the way it has is because the public health systems are weak and that on all levels and so you know i don't want us to forget that long-term play which is investing in strengthening health systems is going to be a critical piece of any pandemic preparedness going forward i, I wanted to go back to something that um michelle and i went back a little bit uh back and forth on over email uh, prior to this panel michelle, how much did we see from you know of uh, the how countries acted externally you know facing outward from their borders how much about how they acted to the rest of the world got then reflected back later internally in terms of you know some of what you and Steve are both mentioning here in terms of how their citizen reacted I mean how influential was kind of the international presence or the kind of the leadership presence externally how did that show back up in how people behaved, you know, because we've been doing this long enough to kind of see that feedback loop, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. How much of that feedback loop did happen and how did we see it show up? Yeah, well, I mean, this kind of relates to the cultural um, liabilities I was talking about. It's really hard to kind of show up on a global level when you're struggling so much, some cultures internally. I mean, we saw just this really incredible escalation of deaths and cases early on in the U.S. that made it um, very difficult to really um, learn from other places. <laughs> um, I, I want to mention that, you know, there are definitely contexts where um, they really got it right, even though they were very loose. Like New Zealand's a good example of a place that we call ambidextrous, able to tighten up when and, and temporarily tighten. That was a function of great leadership, was a function of uh, people being willing to follow the rules and actually calling out people who were not following the rules. Um, that's actually something we had a problem with here in the US. Like we're really reluctant in, in some cultures to call people out for the norm violations. It's almost a norm violation to do that. Um, and then, you know, I think we need to come up with mechanisms to be able to do that without people um, having a lot of reactants. Um, so um, we do see that ambidexterity. It's a general principle to tighten when there's threat and loosen when it's safe. Uh, and we've had great role models in New Zealand who were able to do that ambidextry really well. Um, but we just, um, like, like a lot of what we're talking about, we weren't prepared for this. Um, cultures that have, haven't had a lot of threat, I should have mentioned that in our, our research, tight cultures uh, in their histories have had a lot of threat. They've had a lot of mother nature's fury. They've had a lot of invasions. So they've learned the hard way that rules matter and that it's okay temporarily to sacrifice liberty for constraint. Cultures that haven't had a lot of threat chronically have had much more resistance to tightening. So um, I think 
you know, to all of what we're saying, we're learning um, that we need to develop these mechanisms um, to get people coordinated more quickly. I want to ask the, the group a question here. You know, we've been spending most of our time on vaccines, but this is kind of not the first time in the pandemic at all that we've had issues of, you know, resource scarcity from an international standpoint. I mean, I remember writing about, you know, swab manufacturers in China and Italy early on and PPE equipment and all those things. How much, I mean, I, I guess, did we do a better job of solving any of those supply mm -hmm. issues versus what we're seeing with vaccines? I mean, I realize it's easier to probably make a you know, a, a swab for a PCR test or an antigen test than it is uh, to make a, you know, a couple doses of, of um, mRNA vaccine. But are there, are there lessons that were learned there that were not somehow applied during vaccines or were, they, were those problems solved differently or have we kind of been repeating the same issue over and over and over again? And I'll throw this one as a, as a jump ball for anybody who wants to grab it first. And I'd like to think that we, uh, the way that um, at least the U.S. government is, is responding on the sort of global need around vaccines is sort of learning from or building on uh, what we witnessed and what we all experienced when it came to, say, masks, right? Um, it's not to say that that is being done um, perfectly as it stands, and that I think if we're doing it right, we are ever evolving and improving on that process, um, but whether it's you know, continuing to work through with WHO and, and through facilities like COVAX. I think that's that's been a lesson learned. I think um, um, being clear and communicative about um, our intentions to share surplus and then following through, um, let alone tracking um, what we've been sharing, I think is, is an important lesson. And then, you know, looking back to the summit of a couple of weeks ago now, where um, there's been an important reset to say, well, or ask, is that is this enough? Uh, and from us and from the, all of us collectively. And if the answer is no, well, what more can we do? You know, or to what have we committed that we've sort of followed through on and what is still pending? So those to me are, are lessons from this year, from um, the, the year past, building on where we are today, looking towards innovations like oral antivirals. Um, it's very important to me that we continue to learn from, uh, learn lessons, particularly around equity and access. And it's my hope that we can apply these lessons or continue to apply them to, again, treatments, if not tests, and still supplies, which, which there's still a need for uh, on the front lines around the world. That's my, you know, it's my take having been in this position um, the past seven or eight months, I guess, and, and having lived outside of government as well um, when every, all of this started. But it's, a, you know, it's an important question and, and we have to hold ourselves accountable, certainly. Steve, I want to pivot this over to you. Can I, can I actually um, pivot this to you from a little bit of a, a China perspective? I wanted, we have an audience question here I want to get to. It was, it was roughly framed around the idea of, you know, how did the United States and China kind of react differently? But maybe if I can, you know, as part of your answer here, um, you can also kind of incorporate you know, given where you have the, the two seats that you, you sit in um, around the globe, how kind of China's resource sharing um, and, and, and um, you know, outside its borders, export and, and cooperation has evolved over the course of the pandemic. Um, uh, don't let me stop you from what you were about to say, but if you can toss in a little bit of that um, as well, I'd be, I'd be quite interested to hear. Yeah, and you know the China's thing is just so multifaceted. We can go in a lot of directions, but let me let me follow up a quick a quickly on Lois because I do think there are um, you know places that we're learning and gaining momentum and traction. That said, having been you know scramble in the scramble to get the governor here, you know masks or you know getting you know the, the PPE right, their syringes, it, they're all quite different. And mm -hmm. and unfortunately, you know I think we know that we have to have better coordination, et cetera. But you know vaccines, 
they're the they're the you know the kind of the magic here, but they're also highly regulated. There are a minimal number of, of 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 suppliers ultimately, whereas these other things, much less regulation, much more market dynamics around supply. So th th there are lessons, but there are also quite distinctive uh, in their issues. So on the diagnostic side, it's a much different dynamic right now. On the antiviral, we're working on all fronts, but um, uh, and I do think you know ultimately. Ultimately, the good news here is that there is sort of an end-to-end -end view that is emerging. And, and I think as we look at these recommendations and call to actions to get ahead of the next pandemic, I've been involved in quite a few of those. Um, you know, we're seeing a more consolidated view of all these different parts rather than just one. So I think that's a lesson in and of itself. Now, on the China side, um, you know, there you, uh, you could write books on this, but um, yeah, there, the, the response was so vastly different um, in, in many ways. Obviously, even parking aside, which is hard to do in COVID, the origins question and story and complications and the politics around all of that, um, in terms of just the response, um, both domestically and et cetera, I mean, China really has had very few deaths, very few, and, and people say, oh, you can't believe the data. We know that most of this data is pretty solid and around uh, things like that based on their social media models models, et cetera, um, and, and they've really controlled it. I mean, I've been watching that control. Um, what China also has done is tried to step up to um, uh, being more of a global player. So they've actually supplied as many or more vaccines than anyone else outside their border. Um, uh, but it gets very complicated. The story starts to because partly the model of vaccines and activated vaccines typically have been, you know, less effective. So that's actually a limiting factor to, you know, acceptability. There's also how the politics of all these uh, deals have been structured. Um, but but you know that what we have seen, because China has a huge amount of capability around PPE manufacturing, syringes, they're still supplying most of the syringes for the globe. That that we are trying to you know facilitate as much market you know um, you know urging those markets to step up to you know to, to engage, um, and 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 there's been quite a bit of engagement. The, the Xi Jinping set up a. Uh, a high level commission uh, that was quite unprecedented in China from a governance point of view to oversee the, the pandemic's response at the global, uh, at the domestic and global level. And we're already seeing a lot of, um, uh, you know, just changing in the regulatory environment because they recognize that they didn't get WHO pre-qualification fast enough. So how do they make sure that their regulatory model is, is better so it can get WHO pre-qualification faster. Things like that are uh, the outcomes of some of this, which I think will over, overall pretend well for the, the world going forward. So um, I want to ask, um, we have about six minutes left here, six or seven minutes left, and I want to use this as an opportunity to, to spend a little bit of time on, on wrap up and summary and, and kind of go one by one and feel free to react to each other. But Let's fast forward a year or two from now and we can kind of assume or hope that the crisis part of the pandemic is mostly done and life is, you know, norm, back to normal or whatever the new normal is. Of everything that we've talked about today, you know, if you were in that moment looking back, how will you judge whether or not, you know, we've succeeded or failed not just in how we responded to this pandemic, but what we did after it was hopefully over to prepare for the next one. When the, when the crisis is passed, how will we make a judgment on whether we made a, whether we you know, engaged really long-term success on this? Um, we'll start with Michelle and then go to Lois and then Steve and, and please feel free I'll, I'll make sure to keep us on time here, but feel free to react to each other um, as well as we go around. Yeah, I, I think this is a fabulous question. And uh, it really got me thinking, you know, what criteria would, would will we use to judge uh, how prepared we are for the next pandemic um, and the next crisis? Um, they've, many people have said this is a dress rehearsal um, for what's to come. So I would, of course, as a psychologist, look to the preparation we've done uh, to anticipate the human reaction, the resistance that we've seen uh, during this threat. Um, I would wonder, have we figured out how to clearly communicate threats so that people understand the necessity um, and the severity of this, the crisis and the importance of following rules? 
Um, as I've mentioned, germs are really abstract and they're invisible. So the threat's easier to ignore. Um, we wanna signal it's real, but also give people the efficacy that we can, that we can defeat it. I would also look to see if we developed interventions to help people trust science and reduce information, uh, misinformation. Um, it's exciting to see a lot of work being done on this, a lot of interdisciplinary teams around the world uh, trying to figure out how to do this. Um, and also I think fundamentally, um, will we know how to better unite under threat uh, to go beyond partisanship and ethnocentrism uh, there's, again, a lot of interesting work going on on this, a big tournament going on here in Stanford by Rob Willer uh, and his colleagues um, trying to figure out how do we reduce partisanship. Um, and I, I would stay tuned for that data because I think it's going to be really important as we prepare for other threats. Lois, let's go to you. Yeah, um, so I would really be looking to how people are faring on the other side of it, right? And, um, you know, when I think about how we prepare for the next, uh, another pandemic, which, you know, we could say is inevitable, um, which we hope it isn't, but it, but it might be upon us sooner than we think. What is our, how are we positioned to ensure we can respond to protect the people most at risk, period, right? Um, and so what are these, Health systems, you know, back to C's point about, about public health systems um, and sort of primary frontline healthcare. What does that look like? And what's that, not just the resilience, but the readiness to, to, to deal with, to, to sort of absorb the shock of another pandemic? Um, how are we also outfitting a system or the, the parts of that system, like the workforce, like, you know, data and surveillance labs and other pieces, supply chain, um, to not only address um, a global health emergency, but um, ensure that we're protecting other parts of public health. You know, a lot of things like maternal child health and HIV AIDS and TB and other issues were left by the wayside in all of this. So what is, you know, what are we shoring up um, to ensure we're all gonna be okay? Um, an important piece of that too is just, is also looking at our institutions. And so I wanna be sure that you know, a WHO or, or other places and spaces um, really also have the resources that they need so that they can respond in a way they, they could have or should have in the wake of all this. I don't wanna have to work so hard to make a case for prevention, right? And preparedness. And hopefully that's, you know, that's the position in which we'll find ourselves. I think the last thing I'll look to though is ensuring we're not just looking to global institutions and the usual suspects, right? The US's, you know, the G7, um, countries, but we're truly um, seeing a sort of decentralized, even democratized model, right? So, you know, we talk about even what it looks like to drive regional manufacturing uh, and relying less on um, some of these supplies or vaccines or other innovations coming out of um, sort of a couple of places, but really um, being a, a part of what we see truly globally. And so um, whether it's investments in Asia or Latin America, what does it look like then on the other side of this to be able to rely on those types of as hubs or nodes uh, to bring to bear what we'll all need in the future? Steve, I wanna turn to you to wrap this up. I mean, and, and maybe specifically you can include in this answer, you know, what has this taught us about both the role and needs for you know, large, well-resourced you know, global philanthropic institutions like the Gates organization, where you know obviously a huge amount of reliance um, on, on, on their participation, but also in some ways a very different crisis um, that, than Gates has dealt with in the past. Yeah, well, first I'd say what they said, because those were both <laughs> great, great, full, really packed idea, set of good ideas. And I love the, you know, Michelle, your comment about, you know, trusting science again is going to be core to a lot of this as we go forward. You know, I guess my two thoughts, and then I'd love to frame it around both Gates, but also around Stanford, which, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm teaching at the GSB as well. And, and 
sort of what the role of Stanford is, is in all of this too, is um, one is I, I get the thing I most worry about and I already hear it in language is like we're done with the pandemic or now we're back to normal. And like we have an obligation, we in this room and we in the community to not let that happen. We cannot play fifth grade and five-year-old soccer here. We've been doing it a number of times. So when this happens, everybody chases the ball down the field and then they all chase it down the next field and we forget the play that we need to play that what we need to do between plays and 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 that's what I worry about that we're so quick to get over this that and fatigued that we're going to forget how important now it is to double down now and invest in these systems and pandemic etc so I hope that there's a role for places like the Gates Foundation um, I think they are committed we put together an action a call for action participated in the summit but otherwise to say here's a suite of things that need to be done from surveillance capability to you know and and, and to um, you know these sort of understanding regulatory mandates that can help supplies chains move faster and things like that. And at the bottom line, it's money too, right? You know, like there needs to be financing available. Um, I, I also think that places like Stanford have a, an important role, whether in the medicine school of medicine or the school of uh, GSB or others. Like we need you know important institutions to keep this on the agenda and figure out you know I, I i work on the social innovation agenda like how do we make sure that social innovation matters in the next pandemic so you know we build enough capability and thinking and research and 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 so that it these issues of of, of misinformation and mis and, and inequity are not just uh, casualties the next time, but they're actually, you know, something that we've actually contemplated and addressed in some of our work. So I'm hoping we can do that. I'm an optimist by nature, but uh, I know that's a long road ahead, but thanks for uh, engaging us. Well, um, maybe we can all check back in, in two years and uh, give this a, a grade on, on how we performed, hopefully um, in person rather than, uh, than virtually. Um, I want to thank our fantastic panelists for taking time out of their incredibly busy days. Um, thank you very much to Stanford. Um, and uh, I'll say goodbye from New York and head th hand things back over to Dean Levin to continue the uh, discussion. Great. Thank you, Drew. And uh, thanks to all the panelists for an absolutely terrific discussion. That was really interesting and thought provoking.